So today's topic was the same topic that Rabbi Jay announced last week about when Am Yisrael said Nasa Benishma. And it's sort of a famous topic because almost everyone who went through the regular Jewish education system grew up learning that Am Yisrael said Nasa Benishma. They accepted the Torah before receiving it. It's like almost ingrained into our Jewish education. And then as you get older, maybe in high school or so, you start learning Chumash and you realize the first that Chazal quote that we said Nasev and Ishma, that Am Yisrael accepted the Torah before getting the details, before the Ten Commandments, it just so happens it's recorded four chapters later in chapter 24. There's the Ten Commandments, there's Shmuel chapter 20. And the story of Am Yisrael reciting and saying Nasev and Ishma and accepting the covenant is four chapters later, not only after the Ten Commandments, after three chapters of laws called Parshat Mishpatim. But for some reason, Chazal, quoted by Rashi, they claim that that story is out of place. The goal of today's share is nice and simple. I'm not going to take sides. I simply want you to appreciate why there's a machloket. What's the argument? And why both arguments make a lot of sense. It's going to be a famous argument between Rashi and Ramban. Rashi is going to claim that Chumash is out of order. And the story in chapter 24 happened in chapter 19. And Ramban is going to keep Chumash in order and say, Leave Chumash alone, it's fine. It makes more sense than happened afterwards. At the end of the show, I'll try to give a reason why God wanted, the, I want to suggest a reason why God wanted Ramban and Rashi to have a machloket. In other words, Chumash writes in a way that the story could be understood either way and what we gain from that. If we have time, we'll get that in the end. Today's show may be a little technical, but it's a lot of methodology. I simply want, let me explain the methodology. My assumption is as follows. I think I mentioned this several times. There's two stages in study. The first stage is called objective analysis. Second is subjective interpretation. What's objective? You study the text, you study the words, you study the flow, you follow the storyline. What's happening? That's objective. You can argue, but you know, bottom line, um, the best example. It's quite objective that, I'll give an example from Mount Sinai. It's quite objective that the flood story and the Mount Sinai story are parallel. They're both 40 days and 40 nights. Both heroes are saved by a teva, which is unique. Both find favor in God's eyes. Both God makes, to both of them, God makes an offer, let me kill you, let me kill everyone, make you the only one. Both have covenants, both have changing minds. Now, there's lots of differences, but when you start putting all that together, you realize something's going on. So the parallels are objective. The meaning of that parallel, that's subjective. So Chazal say things that, um, you know, Kodesh Baruch Hu wanted to give, you know, why do we need first Luchot and second Luchot? You know, why do we need two? How come? Okay. So it's very similar to before the flood and after the flood. So subjectively, you can give a lot of interpretations, but all the interpretations are rooted in that first stage objective analysis. So the first thing I want to do is simply objectively go through and show you the problems. And, and when you try to study in order and as we study, we'll try to understand what's what's going on. Today's topic again is from revelation to um, limitation. And when we said Nasev and Ishma, based on what we did last week. Okay, the first thing I want to do is identify units. And for that, I'm going to use a, I'm going to use a, just a Hebrew Tanakh because we're not going to translate any words. I just want to show you a pattern. If the best thing if you have, if everyone has a Chumash at home and you can follow with a real Chumash at home, It'll help your understanding. I'll show, I'll share the psukim online. If you take a minute and take a chumash, you'll see how helpful it'll be for your own understanding. So I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to open up my chumash too. Um, we don't need Allah Torah yet. Here we go. Um, I'm going to open up a regular chumash in Sefer Shmot. And we're going to start where we started in chapter 19. Perik Yotet. We spent a lot of time on this before, but basically, Perik Yotet is one big parshia, which we went through it before many times. It's one big story of- oh, I can't hear it. Chapter 19 is basically the story of everything that happened before the Ten Commandments. We talked about the proposition, the preparation, the revelation, and the limitation. We'll go over that source sheet in a minute. What I want to begin with, um, that's chapter 19. If you look at chapter 20, which we also talked about last week. It begins with the Ten Commandments. 
Again, the translation is less important now. It begins with the Ten Commandments. Um, when they're over, there's that little story. We called it fear story. The people hear all the, the noise and the screaming and shouting and the, the shofar blowing, and they got scared and they begged Moshe, we want you to speak to us and not God. Uh, we call that story trepidation or fear story. Okay. And then Moshe tells the people, don't be afraid because fear is good. God wants you. Where they, where the Moshe told them, you know, come back where you were or don't go any farther away, we said was an argument. But bottom line, by a modam erchok, the people stand at a distance and Moshe goes into the cloud where God was, most likely to speak to God. Now, this little story, which we spent time on the last two weeks, this little story here, which was we called when we went from God's plan B, what the people asked for, the, the direct contact, and went back to plan A, we're speaking through Moshe. We were looking for the story in our study of chapter 19. For today, I'm, I'm going to leave the story where it is. Remember, Chazal put this story between commandment number two and three to explain the change from first person to third person. Ramban, we'll see, puts it earlier. I'll keep, I'll follow right now just for the sake of clarity. I'll follow Ebenezer and keeps the story where it is. You'll see why it makes so much sense. The people are standing at the bottom of the mountain and Moshe goes to the Raphael where God is. Look what happens in the end of chapter, in the end of chapter 20, right after the Debrot. God tells Moshe, go tell the following to the Jewish people. Now what's important for me, I'm going to put here what I call, I'm going to put here what I call quotation marks. Let me get my annotation here. Right here, I need a, I need a, right? If I was putting uh, punctuation here, God told Moshe, here's what you tell B'nai Israel, quotation mark. Atem read them. If you were in school, I'd, I'd give you a 10 minute assignment and have you find where you close the quotation mark. I'll do it with you. But basically, God begins speaking here to Moshe Rabbeinu to tell him to tell the following laws to the Jewish people. So I put a quotation mark right here before I tell them. And as a student, what I need to do now, I need to identify where does God finish talking to Moshe Rabbeinu? It's something you always have to do when you study Chumash. God speaks to Moshe, God says something, open quotation mark, end quotation mark. And that defines a unit. So God begins here talking about, um, what's he talking about? About laws about how not to serve God. Don't make me, you know, don't make golden images out of me or, but instead keep it simple. Make, make a, a mizbeach adamah, an earthen mizbeach. And laws about making a stone, a stone mizbeach and things like that. But even though this ends Parsha Yitro, what people don't realize is God continues speaking in Parsha Mishpatim in chapter 21. God begins talking in the end of chapter 20, but doesn't stop talking at the end of chapter 20. He continues talking in chapter 21. That's going to be Parsha Mishpatim, laws of Evedi Ivri, Amai Vriya, etc. Laws about damages, about you know, assault and damages. The famous Mishpatim laws, which we call Masechet Nizikim. Laws about damages, which continue into chapter 22. Halfway through chapter 22, there's a bit of a change of topic where we go from damages. We talk about responsibility of Shomrim, of people watching things for other people. We talk about someone stealing, things like that. But any type of damage you can cause somebody, causing financial damage one person to another person, either to his property or to his property. And then we have some laws about ethical behavior starting in, in, um, in verse 20, Viger lo tone, don't um, oppress another a stranger, you were strangers in Egypt, and about lending money and not taking interest, and being a good citizen and paying your taxes on time. And that continues again into chapter 23. Also I want to point out is that God talks after the end of chapter 20, God talks to Moshe Rabbeinu for three more chapters, all chapter 20, 20 all chapter 21, 22, and 23. In 23, we end with the Shalosh Regalim, okay, with finally with Lot Fashagdi Bachalevi Mo, the famous line. And even though the law section is over, afterwards there's a promise about, I'm going to bring you to the land of Israel. I'm going to help you conquer the land of Israel. I'll send a malach, some type of messenger, to help you. The people assume it's going to be Moshe. You better listen to him. And if you listen to him, I'll help you conquer the land. If you don't listen, you'll be in big trouble. And then he makes all these promises. If you follow my laws, I'll help you conquer the land and be healthy and be a strong nation. But make sure not to make a covenant with them. 
Basically, I close the quotation mark right here at the end of chapter 23. So basically, from the end of chapter 20 to the end of chapter 23, God is speaking to Moshe Rabbeinu. That's a unit. If we have time next week, we're going to open up this unit and see what's inside. For today, sure, it's a closed box. It's a closed box. Meaning, God speaks to Moshe Rabbeinu, tells him, tell these laws and these words to the Jewish people. It's 95% laws, and the last 5% is a promise about um, God's going to send a malach, and you better listen to him. He'll, if you follow the laws, let me just read one line, which will be important later on. What does God say uh, to Moshe to tell the people? I'm going to send a malach. This, in fact, this I'm going to do for you in English Hebrew. We'll go now to Sefer Shmot, wrong book. If you have your Chumash, you can open up the end of chapter 23 in chapter Shmot. In verse 20, what does God promise? I'm going to send a messenger. I'm going to send a messenger to bring you to the place I got ready for you. Be careful. Listen to him. Don't rebel against him because he won't be able to forgive your sins. But if you do listen to him, remember this phrase, if you obey this messenger and do what I say to do, people think this is going to be Moshe Rabbeinu who's sent by God, who gives them commandments and helps them defeat their enemies. Then if you obey my messenger and follow my laws that I'm saying, that he's saying on my behalf, then your enemies will be my enemies, your adversaries will be mine. Basically, I hope you conquer the land. And then my malach will lead the way and help you conquer the land of Israel and bring you to the land of the seven nations and destroy them. When you get there, don't bow down to other gods. Instead, serve Hashem, your God, and he'll bless you and, he'll bless you and things will be good. Basically, follow me, life will be good. Don't follow me, you're in big trouble. And then we promise the borders and then remind again, don't make, don't make covenants with these other nations and they'll lead you astray. In theory, now, here's what's important now. Three chapters of laws and a promise. What should happen next? The next thing that should happen, for me, Moshe should come down and tell the people what God said. So I'll make up a verse. What should the verse say? Um, Moshe came down from the mountain and told the people all the laws that God said. Something like that, right? That was chapter, we just finished chapter 23. Let's look at the beginning of chapter 24. Again, following your commission. Remember, we just finished chapter 23, the end of that three chapters of, um, of laws. Look how chapter 24 begins. In fact, I'm purposely going to skip the first two lines. You'll see why in a minute. I'm going to read verse three. Pretend that verse one and two don't exist. I'm going to read Pasa Gimel. Boyavo Moshe, Moshe came, by Saper Amit Kodi Hashem, he told the people all the words of God that kolam ishpatim and all the commandments. And the people answered everything, these things that God said, we're going to do. Now, if verse three was verse one, I don't think there would be any argument among anybody. Because what's this referring to? Moshe came down from the Arafel on the mountain where he was before, told the people, what are the divrei Hashem? Those are the promises and the laws about, you know, God's going to help you conquer the land and the basic laws about, uh, about building a Mizbech and how to serve me. And the Mishpatim are the laws of Parsha Mishpatim. And because the people haven't heard these yet, they heard the Ten Commandments, but they didn't hear these yet. What did the people do? The people answer in unison and say everything that God said we're going to do. Okay. And then Moshe writes it down, all the words of God, he gets up in the morning, we'll see, he makes the ceremony. And um, he makes the ceremony. He sends the young people of Israel, they bring sacrifices, not just olot, not just burnt sacrifices, but also shlamim, which means it's a flesh of cookout. I mean, we're going to have a national gathering where we ratify these laws and have a kiddush, a flesh of kiddush. Right? And then Moshe takes half the blood and puts them in containers to save them. And the famous line, which is 24 7, in case you never noticed, he takes the book of the covenant. I'm clear what it means, but something that he's going to read aloud in public, possibly the Ten Commandments, possibly the laws of Parshat Mishpatim. Some people say it's Parshat Bahar. There's a wide range of, of argument of what it's referring to. 
But what's important for us, Moshe reads in this public ceremony aloud, the Sefer Abrit, and now what do the people say? Everything that God said, but Moshe reads the Sefer Abrit, this book of covenant out loud, and everyone ratifies it saying, from now on, that's Pasuk 24-7. And that's the famous line that even though it's in chapter 24, after all these laws, from the time you were in kindergarten, probably, you were taught Rashi's opinion that this entire story happened before the Ten Commandments. And if I leave the story alone, it makes perfect sense why, that's what Ramban's going to say. Leave it alone, it makes perfect sense the way it is, why move it? I want to explain to you why Chazal are going to move it. But let's finish the story so we have it right. Um, after Moshe reads the, this um, book aloud, this book of the covenant aloud, and the people ratify it, and they say, Nasa Shema, Moshe takes the blood that he put in the in those big containers, in the Aganot. He sprinkles the blood on the people, the dam of the parim, the dam of the cows that we shechted. The blood that I'm sprinkling upon you is symbolic of this covenant that God made between on, on these terms. Now, are these Dvarim, the Ten Commandments? Are these Dvarim, we'll see maybe the proposition? Are these the Dvarim, the laws of Parshat Mishpatim? Unclear, but the nation of Israel is accepting the covenant in unison with, with a flesh of Kiddush in a public ceremony. Now, at the end of the ceremony, after all the people have blood sprinkled upon them and everyone ratifies this aloud, a leadership group of the nation goes up, up Mount Sinai, higher up than the rest of the people, sort of to, sort of to accept the contract on behalf of the people. Moshe, the Aaron Nadav Avihu, Moshe, Aaron, Nadav and Avihu, Aaron's sons, and 70 elders of Israel go up the mountain. And what do they do? Pay careful attention. That means they saw God. Doesn't mean they feared. This means this is not, not one yud, not two yuds. They saw God. They saw the God of Israel. What's that mean? Because you can't see God, but they saw this vision of God. Whatever this vision was, they saw symbolically the bottom of his feet, the bottom of God's feet. And the bottom of God's feet, which is God's lowest level symbolically, was the brightest thing anyone could see. Like the like the work of a, the bright a sapphire stone. Like the very heavens of clearness. It means they had this big, white, bright vision of God. It's hard to explain exactly what happened, but the main thing is they see God. Was that good or bad? Unclear. But El Tzilei B'nei so to these nobles, God did not send his hand. It means he didn't kill them, even though they looked at God. Now, is that good or bad? We'll see in a minute. They envisioned God, or they saw God, or had this high level of God. And by by they and they drank. That's the end of the story. There's a pay here. This story from chapter, from verse 1 to 11, Chazar are going to move it earlier. Ramban's going to leave it where it is. Now, starting at verse 12 is another story. For sure, everyone agrees it happened later. But we're going to focus now exactly on this little story here. <coughs> from chapter 1 to, I mean, from verse 1 to um, 1 to 11 in chapter, I mean, it's a little bit smaller for a minute, so you see it. This little story from verse 1 to, to 11. This is see in the background from verse one all the way till here. This whole unit right here. The question where this story goes. Now, again, had the story begun in Pasuk Gimel the way we read it, leave it where it is. And what are we doing? After hearing three chapters of laws, we're going to ratify the covenant again. We ratified the covenant after the proposition, do you want to be my nation? We sort of like initialed it or ratified it. And now after hearing the Ten Commandments and three chapters of laws about day-to-day -day life in Judaism and some very basics and promises about coming to land, we're going to ratify it again. That's a simple way to understand and that's what Ramban's going to say. Again, for some reason, Chazal are going to take this story and move it earlier. We'll see we're in the middle of chapter 19. Soon we'll see why. What makes everything complicated, let me just take a quick break and make sure I didn't miss anything in the chat. Um, take a quick break.
Um, okay, about Ellis and Rachel, we'll deal with later. Okay, and this thing, we'll deal with those questions in the, after the, at the end of this year. Okay, let's take a look now. Again, we started reading here with Pasa Gimel. The problem is, and the problem begins because we have to start with Pasuk Aleph. Remember again, at the end of chapter 23, we finished God speaking to Moshe Rabbeinu three chapters of laws. If I put that aside and continue the narrative, something doesn't make sense in verse one. The El Moshe Amar, it was said to Moshe, unclear by who? Someone told Moshe to do what? Ale El Hashem, go up to God, which probably means go up to Mount Sinai, where God is. Not just by yourself, but together with Atav, Aron, Nadav, Abihu, Vishibim, Vishidne Yisrael, Vishachavita, Merachok. Moshe is commanded by someone, either by God or by some messenger of God. Chazal say Matatron, the name of, a, of an angel. But Moshe was told, given instructions about making a ceremony. And what was the ceremony? It was told to Moshe, go up the mountain, ascend the mountain, together with Aaron, Nadav, and Abihu. And what do you do when you get up there? Bow down from a distance. Unclear why, when, but again, this is, we're not expecting this verse when I finish chapter 23. When I finish chapter 23, I'm expecting Moshe to come down and tell the people the laws. For some reason, when that section is over, instead of telling me the story of Moshe teaching the laws, we have this sort of past perfect introduction that someone had told Moshe to go up the mountain together with the elders of Israel and bow down from a distance to God. And then afterwards, this is still part of the commandment. Then afterwards, Moshe should leave those 70 elders and go by himself up to God. The Haim lo yigashu, Haim is the 70 elders and the Davin of you shouldn't go with him. And the people shouldn't come up with him at all. Keep this in mind. Mm -hmm. There's three groups there. There's the people, the farthest away. There's the seven, Aron, the Davin Abihu, and the 70 elders, we'll call them now the Kohanim, who go up higher than everyone else, but not to the top. And Moshe goes all the way to the top. That model, we're going to find itself mirrored in the Mishkan. Because what do we have in the Mishkan? We have the Kodesh Kodeshim, where only the Kohen Gadol can go in. That's like Moshe on top of Har Sinai. We have the Kodesh, where only the priests, only Kohanim can enter. That's like the Davin Abihu and Aaron and the 70 elders. And then we have the Azara, the courtyard of the temple, where the altar is, which is like the bar of the mountain, where people are bringing Karbanot and all the nation can come as long as they're Tahar. So these three levels are going to repeat themselves over and over again in the laws of the Mishkan. And we'll see later the Mishkan is going to reflect exactly this experience. That's why it'll be so important. Now, but these two psukim stand alone, but that's what causes the confusion. What's clear though, that these are instructions that Moshe Rabbeinu received about making a ceremony. Now the question is, what's it doing here? Well, before I talk about where to put the story, there's no doubt that these two verses serve as an introduction to what follows now in verse three. Why? Because in this ceremony where Moshe comes down and tells the people the words of God and Moshe writes it down and we have a big Kiddush and we sprinkle the blood, at the end of that ceremony, after Moshe sprinkles the blood, what happens? The commandment in Pasuk Aleph and Bet, this commandment of Pasuk Aleph and Bet, Moshe going up to the mountain to get the Aaron and Davin Abihu and bowing down from a distance, it's exactly what happens in verse 9. After Moshe sprinkles the blood on the people, here are the Am at the bottom of the mountain. Moshe sprinkles the blood on them. And then Moshe goes up with Aaron and Davin Abihu and 70 elders. That's fulfilling the commandment of verse 1. And this group, what did they do? They were told to bow down from a distance, but they also saw God. And, and they saw this amazing vision of the bottom of God's feet. And nothing happened to them. They saw God and they ate and they drank. Now, there's a massive argument here whether these people did the right thing, they were supposed to eat and drink, or they did the wrong thing, but God did not, did not want to ruin the day. I'll, I'll, I want to frame the argument between Misnagdim and Chassidim. I'll explain why. Let me stop this share for a minute so I can see people. Um, what's the argument? Is being so close to God and eating and drinking at the same time in your closeness to God, is that the highest level of serving God? Ask any chassid, he'll tell you for sure. 
a chassid will tell you, no, that's the highest level. Uh, Purim is a higher level than, than Yom Kippurim. You know, the idea of being so close to God and being able to drink, eat and drink in front of God, that's like the highest level possible. Any misnagi to tell you, how could such a thing be? In front of God, you're a nobody. How could you even think of eating or drinking? And these people should have been killed and because I was going to say they get punished later on for what happens. It's just not by chance that none of an avil died later on by um, being too close to God and doing th things they shouldn't have done, not respecting the, the temple enough. And the 70 of the elders all get, you know, basically wiped out as well, all the leadership. So again, I'm not, I'm trying, I'm trying to present both sides of it, but there's a good question whether this is something good or bad. Now let's go back. That's just a side point. Let's go back down. This story, if I leave it where it is, it happens after the Ten Commandments, um, after they've um, and after Parshat Mishpatim, and and uh, it's a ceremony on all the laws. Was there something in this story, other than the fact that they saw God? I mean, I guess maybe that. What else is problematic about the leadership being able to see God? Does that contradict chapter 19 or flow of chapter 19? Remember our study of chapter 19 with plan A and plan B? Plan, I'll just review it. Plan A, let me go back to my, uh, I'll go back to the short seat we were using with all last week. But we have chapter 19 nice and organized. What do we have here? Remember we had the proposition. We, we arrive in Mount Sinai. God tells Moshe, go make this proposition to the people. Look what I did for you. Now, are you willing to be my people? Are you going to obey me, keep my covenant, be my special nation, and you'll be a mamlechet kohenim b'goy kadosh? That was the proposition we talked about. And again, see the word. These are the devarim. Pay attention to the word. These are the terms or the words that Moshe should tell the people. Moshe calls the elders of Israel, puts these devarim in front of them. Okay? And the people answered, and then what did they say? Everything that God said we're going to do. And then Moshe brings the words back to God. That's why B'nai Israel accepts the proposition. Now, before I go any farther, could this be something that could be read? Could this be referred to as a Sefer Abrit? Could this be the book of the covenant that people say Nasa Vedishma to in a, form, in a formal gathering? That's going to be one possibility, but keep that in mind. There's definitely a brief there between two sides. Are you willing to obey me, be my covenant partner, and be for me? This, this could be the key point of a working agreement, which we call the proposition. But reading this aloud in public and people answering in unison, Nasa Vedishma, would make sense. Even though they accepted it here, here it was their, like a third party system. Moshe told the elders and the elders told the people and we got back. It could be that the story in chapter 24 is making this formal. That's one possibility. Now, because if, if the story happened earlier, we have to see where in chapter 19 it takes place. So Moshe tells the people, and then we had God's plan for transmitting the laws. Remember God told Moshe, I'm gonna to come to you in the thickness of a cloud. That was the al Rafael idea. So the people here, when I over here, when I speak to you and then they believe what you're saying is from God and the people we followed Rashi said, we don't want plan A, we want plan B. We want to see God directly. If you prepare right, God says, you can see me after three days. Then there's three days of preparation. And then after the third day of preparation, it's big, the big day, there's thunder and lightning. But instead of everyone being at the mountain, people were afraid. Moshe brings them back from the mountain. And the mountain's full of fire again and shaking. And then what happened? We had this, we said the Ten Commandments, so something was happening. And Moshe would speak and God would answer him. And we had a big argument. Is this the Ten Commandments or is this um, a conversation? But that was chapter 19. What we skipped last week, and the last every time we read chapter 19, and you'll see why we skipped it now, was verses 20 to 25, which precede chapter 20, which is the Ten Commandments. If I follow again Chazal, verse 19 was, was the Ten Commandments, and everything else is a footnote. But let's read this story and point out why it doesn't make any sense. Let's read in verse 20. Again, we're in chapter 19, right before the Ten Commandments, if I keep Chumash in order, and here's the story. Let me make it a little bit bigger. Okay. 
Vayered Hashem Har Sinai. God comes down. It's over here. Okay. Up a little bit. There we are. Okay. Vayered Hashem Har Sinai. God comes down on the mountain. El Rosh Har. We never had that before. God was on the mountain. Now God comes from the mountain down to the top of the mountain or back up to the top of the mountain, depending how you understand it. It's really strange here. It's God was on the mountain, and now God comes to the top of the mountain. God summons Moshe, come up to the top of the mountain, and Moshe comes up. Even Moshe might have been with the people. God said, Moshe, you, know, you come up by yourself. Now, Pasach verse 21. Raid ha'ed ba'am. Go warn the people. Warn them about what? Pen yersu al Hashem lirot benafam imenu rav. No one can dare look, because if people look at this ceremony, at when the Ten Commandments are going to be given, they're going to die. This seems to be a last-minute warning, as the people stand at the foot of Har Sinai, no peeking. If I'm not mistaken, our custom not to look at the Kohanim when we dochen. It's based on this. Don't look if, if the Kohanim, if God Shekhin is with the Kohanim, you can't look. So God tells Moshe, go warn the people, no peeking, no looking in Har Sinai. Now, if you notice, that sort of negates plan B, doesn't it? Because in plan B, they wanted to see God. And now God's saying, I can't be seen. You can't look. But now look at Pasach Abed. Even the Kohanim who come closer to God, they have to be ready or sanctify themselves, lest God smite them as well. Verse 22 here makes no sense. Hope you understand why. First, if I keep, if I'm only reading chapter 19. I'm talking about a group of Kohanim that have never been mentioned before. There's this conversation going on between God and Moshe Rabbeinu, telling Moshe, telling Moshe, go down and warn the people not to look. And even the Kohanim who come closer to God, you better warn them because God might go and punish them as well. They might break through and look and, and be punished. Who are these Kohanim? We have no idea. Okay, let me take a let me see if anyone picked up on this for a minute. Let's take a look at the chat. Who are these Kohanim? Um, okay. Um, okay, but we talk about Breed. Kadashu. Okay. Um, what's it Kadashu? Um, that's a good question. Do they have to separate themselves? I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Okay. They have to either prepare themselves. I'll tell you what it has to be, I think. If I go back over here in the beginning, when the people asked for plan B, when the people said, you know, God will come on day three, what's God tell the people? When, when God agrees to the people's request to see God, what did God tell them? God says, okay. Okay, go down, that means to get them ready or prepare them. Again, prepare them for this moment, but you prepare yourself by separating yourself. Because what's he tell them later on? You're separating yourself, you know, it's cordon off the mountain, don't let anyone go up the mountain, and no one goes near their wives. Okay? Moshe goes down by Kadesh Ta'am, they wash their clothes and tells them, be ready for day three and don't go near, don't go near your wife. It means separate from your spouses. But it, there's definitely this idea of separation here, but also separation for the purpose of readiness. So again, let's go back to. These verses, chapter verses 20 to 25. God told Moshe, come to the top of the mountain, go down and warn the people, don't come up. But who are these Kohanim who are being warned? Even the Kohanim coming closer, be prepared or set yourself separate because you might be punished also. As soon as you look. Moshe says the strangest thing now. What's Moshe say? Moshe tells God, don't worry about it. The people can't come to the mountain. Moshe tells God, don't worry about it. I warned them already. That's the original warning. For some reason, Moshe, I mean, he does it a lot. He's arguing with God and said, there's no need to. God does it by his argument. He says, no, the people need a warning. 
ויאמר השם אל משה, ויאמר אליו השם, לך רד, you go down, ולית ואתה ברון נמך, you can come up with Aaron, והכהנים ועל העם, אל יעשו לעלות השם פן יפרוץ בעם השם. The Kohanim and the people can't ruin themselves by going up to God because God might smite them. And then Moshe goes down. What should he do? Moshe goes down from the top of the mountain and tells the people, not the Ten Commandments, but rather tells the people this warning, don't come up and don't look. Now, you agree that this story is really strange where it's written. Because why the change in plan And why the need to warn the Kohanim? And who are these Kohanim? And who are these three groups? Where do they come from? All these questions are major questions. If what? If I keep Chumash in order. But what Chazal do, what do they do? They took chapter, they took chapter, that story in chapter 24. If you take the story in chapter 24 and move it during the three days of preparation, then everything makes sense. Let me explain what I mean. Hey, take off the share for a minute. What I, what I want to explain is, what, if I, I'm, try, I'm trying to explain what Rashi is saying. Rashi's only making one mention about something about chronological order, but if I follow Rashi's opinion in chronological order, it goes like this. Rashi's claiming that we get to Mount Sinai, God, Moshe goes up, God says, here's the proposition. You want to be my people. The people say, okay. No, so we tell the elders, the elders tell the people, the people ratify. And then God says, here, how it's going to, I'll speak to you in the thickness of a cloud. The people say, no, we want to hear God directly, or we want to see God. God says, okay, you want that? Three days of preparation. During these three days of preparation, before we get the detailed contract, we're going to have an engagement party. I'll explain what I mean. I want to use um, the proposition. Let me go back to my source sheet. And I'm going to use a wedding analogy, the same one that Chazal used. Let's go back to chapter 19. Make it a drop smaller. Okay. Looking back in chapter 19, we have as follows. The people come to Mount Sinai. Moshe goes up and says, here's the proposition. Do you want to be my people? I'll call that the couple getting engaged. So they decided they're getting engaged. Okay. Oh, you're getting engaged. What do you need now? Uh, we need an official engagement party. So we're, in three days time will be the big wedding. But before we get to the big wedding, let's make an official engagement party and have the whole nation together because this ratification by Moshe telling the elders and the elders telling the people and coming back, that's nice. But now, we, now that the people want to be so close to God, remember when they say we want to be close to God, Moshe says, okay, be ready in three days time. During those three days of preparation, we need to make an engagement party. What's the engagement party need? It needs food, it needs a gathering, it needs a ceremony. And at this point, right here, after the commandment of three days of preparation, before, before day three, Chazal are gonna put it right here. And then it's some kind of marker here. Let me annotate, here we go. They're gonna take chapter 24 and put chapter 24 right here. Between verse 15 and 16. And then what happened? If at this point on the next day, on the first day of the three days or the second day of the three days, we'll see Rashi in a minute who's gonna say this. What happens? We're gonna take this proposition and make it official. And therefore what's gonna happen? Let's read now chapter 24. Let's stop the share. And we're gonna read this story as though it's happening here. Let's go back to chapter 24 which is a footnote to chapter 19 now. And what happened? After the people requested to see God, what did, Moshe, what did God tell Moshe, you know what? The people want to see God? You can come up, God, tells, God told Moshe, you know what? Come up the mountain together with Aaron, Nadav, and Abihu and 70 elders, bow down from a distance. And then afterwards, Moshe will go by himself, um, though to get the actual 10 commandments themselves in the cloud. Um, then Moshe comes down and tells the people these words of God, which are the laws of separation. We'll see in a minute. No, it's, it could be the uh, maybe the official proposition or the words or how to get ready for the for this for the ceremony, and all the mishpatim. We'll see what that might be in a minute in Rashi. Okay. 
And the people say everything that God says we're going to do, it could be, again, they're maybe they're ratifying it or they're saying, we'll follow all these instructions about how to get ready. Okay. Moshe writes down, I think here, the proposition. You want to be a mamlechet koni kadosh. Writes it down, gets it in writing. Not the Ten Commandments, they haven't been given yet, but rather the proposition. You want to be my people. He builds a mizbeach at the bottom of the mountain, 12 monuments representing the 12 tribes, part of the ceremony. He sends some representatives, younger people of Israel, who bring the sacrifices, slaughtering the cows. They take the blood, put them in big containers, and the big, we don't want to call it baptism, but it's with sort of like a baptism with, with, um, with, with um, blood. With, everyone's going to be, have something sprinkled upon them. But first Moshe reads the Sefer Abrit, which in this case might be you, this proposition, do you want to be my people? The same thing that these, the same Devarim that were in chapter 19. According to Rashi, it's Sefer Breshit, which we'll try to explain why in a minute. He reads it out loud to the people and the people say everything that God said, we're going to do not seven Ishma. And therefore, according to Rashi, this is happening before the Ten Commandments, the day after the proposition, or I say at the engagement party. Um, then Moshe takes the blood and sprinkles upon the people, representing you enter this covenant, which you're about to get the details of in a day or two. And then the leadership group, Moshe, Aaron, Adab, and Abihu, bow down, come up the mountain, and they bow down from a distance, and they're able to see God, and, and it's fine. This is plan B happening, isn't it? Well, plan B was supposed to happen. This is like a promo to plan B, but it was okay for the elders. In the meantime, on day three, the people got scared. And they, what do you call it? And they were too fearful of the whole thing. And then God decides plan B is not gonna work. We have to go back to plan A. So what's happening now, if I put this story happening during the three days of preparation, when it came to the 10 commandments now in chapter, at the end of chapter 19, right before the Ten Commandments, let's get them back on, I'm sorry. Again, if this story is happening right over here, before day three, remember the story was happening right here, about that's the Nasev and Ishma in the ceremony, then comes to day three, the people get scared, the people say, and therefore they can't be so close to God anymore. Moshe brings him to the, to the mountain. Things are trembling, etc., And the shofar is blowing. And then Moshe starts speaking and God would answer. But because the people are scared, what's God realize? They can't be so close anymore. We're back to plan A. And therefore, why does God tell Moshe to go warn the people? Go warn the people not to come and look. What's the problem? Why is God worried the people come and look? Everyone knows the problem. Hey, if this group of leaders two days ago were able to see God, they got to go up the mountain. We all want to go up the mountain and see. But this group, this leadership group, two days ago, they ascended the mountain. They were very close to God and they ate and they drank. Maybe we can do the same thing. And everyone would be too close to God. And God says the people are not high enough, are not on a level that they can do that. And therefore, God tells Moshe, go warn the people Enough is enough. And even the Kohanim who were previously allowed to see God, they have to be careful as well because they might also get punished. And basically because we went away from plan B, because plan B is not working anymore, this instruction is no one can see God anymore. And therefore Moshe thinks, don't worry, I warned them already. And God says, no, warn them because I know the people, they're not going to follow rules and warn them. And then only you and Aaron can come up. And Moshe has to go and tell them. But what I'm trying to explain is, is the only way that these psukim at the end of chapter 19 makes sense is if chapter 24 happened already. If the first 11 lines of chapter 11, the Nasa Benishma story happened already. And I think it's, it's this section in chapter 19 that leads Chazal to put chapter 24 earlier. Okay, that was the main, that was the complicated point I tried to make today. Hope that was clear. Let me stop here for questions for a minute. You got my point, I hope? Let me, let me show you in Rashi so you see what I'm talking about. I'll share my screen again and we'll look in good old Allah Torah in chapter 24. There we go. Look at Rashi on chapter 24. And God told Moshe, come up the mountain. 
What's Rashi say? Oh, I'm sorry. I don't see my email. Here we go. Vilmashamar. Parsha Zu Kodam Aserta Dibrot. This Parsha in chapter 24, verse 1, where it, it, it was told unto Moshe, it was said, come up the mountain. Okay. This entire Parsha was before the Ten Commandments on the fourth day of Sivan, meaning the day after the proposition. Remember, they arrived on the third, they arrived, then Moshe went up. Rashi has a day by day uh, what happened. But this is after the proposition, but three days before the Torah is given. Okay. Now, um, then Moshe would go by himself, by himself. That's Tadar Fell. That's what happens after the Ten Commandments, or between two and three, according to Rashi. Moshe goes down and tells the people, What did he tell the people? At Kol Divrei Hashem can't be Pasha Mishpatim anymore because this is earlier. So it's Mitzvot Prishabak Bala, all the laws of preparation. Remember, I told you Rashi puts this story between day, be, during the three days of preparation. So when the people wanted to see God, God said, okay, be prepared. So Moshe came down and told them, here's how to prepare for it. What are the mishpatim? He says, those are the mitzvot b'nei noach that, that um, I guess, re reviewing with them what they um, what they once heard already, just like the basic laws to prepare. That's a bit problematic. I think it could be, the mishpatim could simply be also the part of the laws of, um, of being prepared for the, for the event. Then uh, Moshe writes down the words of God. This is from Breshis all the way till, the, no, he says the first book of Chumash, Breshit, until the story of Matan Torah. And then he gets up in the morning, now it's the fifth of Sivan. He's keeping everything, okay? The Nari Ben Yisaro, the firstborn. He puts the blood in big containers. And then he takes Sefer Breshit, reads out, I mean, Sefer Abrit, he says the Sefer Breshit. And they say, Nasa Benishma, the Sefer Breshit. And then, um, okay, they saw God, they picked what they shouldn't have, and they said that they should have died from that, but he didn't, God didn't want to ruin the moment. Okay. God didn't want to punish them now with Simchat Torah, and he got them later on. And this Kenim, they got it afterwards in Parsha Balotcha. Okay, now with the Mitonanim and the Mitavim. Okay, so that's that's Rashi's opinion. And just quickly, just look at Ramban. Obviously, he's going to argue. Ramban quotes Rashi. Ramban is here. Ramban, actually, I can just put the whole thing on Ramban. Right, I can open up the whole thing. Open up the whole, how do I get the whole section open? I'm not sure. Okay, you can see it from here. What's Ramban say? Okay, first he quotes Rashi. Oh, I'm sorry. Is it going to make it? That does make it bigger. First, he quotes Rashi and disagrees with him. Here we are. He quotes Rashi. It says, Kam Edu Dvarav. Okay. He just quotes Rashi. This is on the 4th of Sivan. And God told Moshe um, that from, from first chapter 12 after, because this is Rashi's opinion. Then he says, Be'ina Parshiot Ha'el. Uh, one second, annotate. Here we go. It says, if I follow that approach, Ramban says, the story doesn't go by anything. It doesn't match the order, nor does it make sense. I'll show you what he says. Clear all the drawings and draw again. And we use this line here. What happens? Because um, what are the Mishpatim? The Mishpatim are not Shema Mishpatim, Eilak Tobim Mamad. What are the Mishpatim? It's Parsha Mishpatim. But we just had beforehand. Because it doesn't mean that these are the Mishpatim of Bnei Noach. Because why would, why would Moshe have to tell the people Mishpat Bnei Noach now? Because by Saper, something new. Anyway, Rosh, Ramban goes in, you can read it later. He beautifully you know, makes his argument against, against Rashi. What I tried to show you today is the reason for the argument. I think the source of the argument are the those last five psukim in chapter 19, which are so difficult to understand because we don't know who the Kohanim are and why this last minute warning. But uh, according to Rashi, if chapter 24 happened earlier, then the story makes sense. Now, if Rashi is correct, the question is why is Chumash out of order? So first I've showed you already, Rashi is consistently taking the story out of order. I'll just give you some quick examples. What did Rashi do? Uh, and let me show you all the things that Rashi is moving out of order which he's doing consistently. 
What did he say? If you remember, where are we here? Um, Rashi said as follows. We had the Ten Commandments, remember? And then we, after the Ten Commandments, we had first, first two in first person, third person. The story after the Ten Commandments, okay? this whole story here, what did Rashi do? Rashi put this story between commandment two and three. And saw it as a footnote. Okay. Um, he also said back in verse 19, that Moshe Yedaber Belim Yenenu Bakol, by this verse, verse 19 over here, Rashi said that's also out of place. And this is talking about the Ten Commandments. So Rashi is consistently moving the parshiot around and seeing each section almost as a footnote. And to put the chronology together, he's got to basically cut and paste everything between chapters 19 and 24. What I want to try to explain is what's the reason for, for what Rashi is doing. Um, I want to begin with Rashi's opinion. Let me stop this here. Rashi claims that Sefer Abrit is Sefer Brishit. What's that mean? I think that totally changes the way we read Sefer Brishit. I don't think that Rashi read from, I don't think Rashi means that when Moshe read Sefer Abrit and people said Nasev Nishma, he read all 50 chapters of Sefer Brishit and the first 10 chapters of Sefer Shmo. That'd be way too long. But in essence, what's Sefer Brishit? Sefer Brishit is why we're chosen. And what Moshe talked about, maybe he did the basics of Sefer Brishit, probably talked about the covenant. But what's happening for the three days of preparation, basically, Am is studying Sefer Brishit before we get to Torah. What's that mean? When I read Sefer Brishit, am I reading a play-by-play -play history of the Jewish people since creation? Or am I reading a composition given to Am Yisrael by God to understand why they're chosen. If I read Sefer Breshit as a book given to the Jewish people for the first time during the three days of preparation before we get the Ten Commandments, after they agreed to be God's people, Am Yisrael needs a book to understand who God is. How come there's only one God? Where they're coming from? Where they're going to? Why did God promise land? How did they end up in Egypt? Why did God take him out of Egypt? Um, who are these 12 tribes? Where, where did the tribes come from? What's God's goal for the Jewish people? If I read Sefer Breshid as a book written to explain to Amisra why they're chosen, then it makes perfect sense that the three days of preparation is a learnathon. It's like a seminar to understand what's the meaning of being Jewish and why are you entering a covenant to be God's people. And therefore, it's called Sefer Abrit. So Moshe might have read some synopsis out loud, but I think the three days of preparation was simply the study of Sefer Breshit. And then if I use that to study Sefer Breshit, how you read the book is, is enlightening because the people, they know there's 12 tribes. Where do these tribes come from? They know they're chosen. What's the meaning of the chosen? Why do we suffer in Egypt for hundreds of years? I need to bring up Tarim. Where's the land of Israel? How come the Canaanites are being thrown out? Where are they coming from? What's the purpose of our chosenness? All those questions are all dealt with in Sefer Breshit. And therefore, before we enter a covenant, we accept it to be God's people. God wants to explain to his people why they're chosen, and that's when God gives us Sefer Breshit. So that's why I like Rashi's approach much better, because I think it's much more meaningful. And why it's Chumash out of order, I'll give the classic answer. Chapter 19, the whole focus is fear. Don't touch, don't come close. Remember we talked about obfuscation? That the, even asking for plan B, asking to be so close to God, is only alluded to and not explicit. And when it happens, it's only alluded to. You have to read between the lines to find out. We talked about that last time. You can, being so close to God, if you don't look for God, you won't find him. And then we talk about how the messages in the media. But chapter 19 focuses primarily on the fear and the importance of fear. Remember the last line? What God told Moshe, what Moshe told the people? Don't, don't be afraid of being fearful because God wants you to be fearful. Let's just show that again. I'm, I'm talking about chapter 19 and 20 together. At the end of the Ten Commandments, which Rashi puts happening in between them. Remember the people tell Moshe what happened to them? Here we are. The people are all fearful and they say, Moshe, we didn't hear from you. And Moshe tells them, Altiro, don't be afraid. God's testing you, God's coming. I want you to be fearful. Don't be afraid of being fearful. It's good to be fearful, but don't be afraid, of, don't go too far away. 
Stay close, but be in fear. And that fits very nicely with this warning, don't look, keep your distance. Now, the story in chapter 24 that we saw, which is like more like Hasidah, what's that mean? There's no fear there at all. There's a party, they're eating, they're eating food, there's a kiddush, a leadership grows up. It's like, it's a, it's a, it's like a, a wedding ceremony with, with, a, with a meal afterwards. And it's singing and dancing and being happy, which is called Ahava. So what happens? Even though they both happened at the same time, they both happened beforehand, Chumash is going to separate the Yira, the fear side, and the Abbas side into two separate sections. And even though they're happening simultaneously, Chumash saves the love story, the, the happiness story, saves it for the end as a footnote to the story when it's all over. And because I think what you learn from there maybe is that when you serve God, it begins with Yira, but ends up with Ava. There's a need for Avan and for Yira, take the two parts of Kriyat Shema. Isn't it the same thing? First one's Vahavta Tasha Melakech, the second one, reward and punishment and fear. And therefore, remember, but ideally you should serve God out of love. So when I present the Ten Commandments in a relationship, you begin with fear. After you've achieved fear and you have the right relationship and you have the awe, then we can talk about Ahava later on and be closer. So there's room for Misnagdim and there's room for Hasidim. But uh, as they say, Rishit Chochma Yirat Hashem, that's a passing in Tidim Kufiyon Aleph, which is also quoted in the first Rashi and Chumash. But that's my take on that's what I want to share with you about Nasa Venishma. So I, I'm assuming today's here was probably the most complicated of all of them. So I hope I didn't lose too many of you, but let's take a look at the, at the I, I warned you it would be a complicated one today, but it's, it's simply the story is so famous of Nasa Venishma being before, I want to explain the way I understand why Rashi moves it earlier. Now, what did Rashi say? All he said is the story's out of order. Rashi doesn't walk you through everything we didn't share today. I'm assuming Rashi did that. What I did today in Shir was objective. I just followed the story and pointed out the problems. Rashi gives you his conclusion. But I think Rashi's conclusion, which is Chazal's conclusion, was based on a careful reading of the text. That tricky Bel Mushal Mar, that third person, you know, instead of continuing the narrative of chapters uh, 20 through 23 and expecting Moshe to come down and tell the people the laws, instead I have another story about a ceremony. And that opening line, Bel Mushal Mar in third person, God had told Moshe to come up the mountain and do the ceremony. That seems to be a footnote to the original story. And then the question is, why is that footnote at the end? Okay, so um, let's take a look at the questions real fast. I don't think there were too many. Um, okay, let's start from the beginning. Okay, Maslow thoughts are fine. Um, okay, let's get from double. Why can't we change the plural to singular? And again, but, oh. The change all, th all through chapter 19 and 20, we go back between singular and plural. The partially didn't pick up on it, but basically it, that reflects if singular and plural about Amisro reflects our nature. Are we one group of people? Like, like uh, that on the opening line, um, we come and then we come in plural we come in plural and we set up camp singular. But that dialectic, are we a bunch of individuals? Are we one people? I think that reflects a, a, a built-in dialectic about being Jewish. Everyone's an individual person, but everyone is part of a nation. So we accept the Torah as a nation, but also as a bunch of individuals. So I think the change from plural to singular is intentional all through. Um, why don't Elazar and Tamar come to the mountain? Um, I guess they're the backup for, uh, you know, it can't, it can't be a whole family thing. I don't know, that's a good question. But Baruch Hashem, they didn't because they were able to take over for Elazar and Itamar. Um, you have that Pasuk in, um, I think it's in, I forgot where, but it says when Elazar and Itamar, when Nadav died, Elazar and Itamar came, took their place. Maybe there's only room for two. But again, that's a good question. Um, I don't have a good answer for it, but I know that they're definitely, take, they come to fix what Nadav and Aviv did wrong. Um, okay, Elazar Shamar sounds like it is past perfect. Thomas Shamar is exactly past perfect. That's why, because it's past perfect, that's why that leads Rashi to understand that it's going to be different. Um, oh, very good. Um, they eat and they drink in front of God. And Moshe doesn't eat, doesn't eat or drink or anything. That sort of indicates that eating and drinking in front of God is not so good. Um, okay. But why the safer upbreed? That's a good question. Um, it's a covenant. If, if it's a safer upbreed, it's a, something written 
that has the covenant in it. It's like the ksuba at a wedding. You know, here are the two sides, here are the two partners, and you read it aloud. Eat uh, kadashu to separate, okay? 70 elders. What was the question about 70 elders? Oh, no, I'm not sure what that was. The 70 elders. Oh, why 70, maybe? 70, I think the book of Rashid explains the number 70 nicely if they got that beforehand. No, it's after 70 nephesh go down to Egypt. So 70 elders have to come and represent the Jewish people later on. Um, yeah. Are the Kohanim the sons of Aaron or the, maybe the Bukharim? It could be. But it seems to me that the, um, the Bukharim, who go, the people, the people bring the Kabbalah, they're called Narim, they're not called Bukharim. But because God already said, Kadesh called Bukhar, I can assume that the Bukharim had a special status. So that's a good question, who the Kohanim are. But if I didn't have the story in chapter 24, I might say the Kohanim are the firstborn. But because of chapter, because of chapter 24 and those three groups, remember? The three groups we have in chapter 24, which is clear. The Am, the Kohanim, and Moshe. And you have the same three group of three, the three groups, they have the same thing in, in the end of chapter 19. I think that's why the two stories go together. Um, okay. Um, how Brit Benton fits into the three, the three, um, what's the last question there? How does Brit Benton Tarim? I'll read the question. Can you explain how Brit Benton fits in? So if we have time, we might talk about it next week. Brit Benton Tarim is Shem Yud Kevavke. Brit Mila is Shem Elohim. Brit Sinai is, is primarily an extension of Brit Mila. All, all the things, the Brit, Old Brit, Benu, Ben. Shabbat being an Obrit, and Elohim says the Dibrot. Um, th that's a complicated share on, on God's names ever since creation, and the two Bechinot of Shem Yudkevavke and Shem Elohim. Too complicated in a, to do in two, three minutes. But in a nutshell, Brit Ben Abtarim is how we become a nation, the God of history, the historical process. Um, Shem Elohim is God who made nature and made, you know, and, and created everything. And, and God picking a nation sort of built into nature to represent God, to keep people to behave properly. But that's that's a whole, to doing, following Shem Elohim and Shem Yud Kevavke and the Britot, and Breshit, that, that, that requires a couple hours of careful reading. Um, Mishpatim has to, I, I agree. No, it's, I don't like Rashi's answer that the Mishpatim was lost from Mara. I think I'd rather, I, I would follow Rashi's opinion that's out of order but I would say Mishpatim is not referring to laws of Mara, but rather laws about preparation for the for the for the ceremony and subjective objective. Where did Rashi put 24, 1 to 11? They put it between between day four and five. It's, they put it between um, I think you know, it's, they put it in chapter 19 between preparation and revelation, or basically between verses 15 and 16. In chapter 19, that's where they put it. Okay. And who are the claim? Ah, okay. Now, so Norman's question is very good. Where does Rashi put Parshat Mishpatim? Believe it or not, Rashi puts Parshat Mishpatim during the first 40 days on Harsina. I, I can't, I, I don't know, how, I understand where Rashi comes from, but because Rashi puts the laws of the Mishkan after, after the Chet so what did Moshe get on the first 40 days in Harsinai? Rashi is going to claim that the first 40 days, Parsh Mishpatim belongs on the first 40 days in Harsinai after chapter 24. But if you follow Rashi, Rashi is moving everything around. Rashi is cutting and pasting the whole book, if you didn't catch on. Got it? Rashi puts chapters 20 through 23, 21 through 23, after chapter 24, after the last section of chapter 24. Instead of, no, it's as it replaces chapter 20. And he moves the Mishkan after Chet Ego. If, if, I wish I could do, I can't do cutouts on, um, I have this in classroom, we do this with cutouts. We take all the sections and pass them around. But I can't do that. I can't figure out how to do that on the computer the right way. It's just too complicated. Some things you need a classroom for. Um, now, what's the last one? I hope you understood 24 seven being Nasa Benishma. That's how cute that was. It just came out that way. It was Christian division. Um, we talk about why we don't know why Ellis Arm don't go up with leadership group, but luckily they didn't because they were saved for later. And most guys, so that was it. I think we covered them all. Oh, no, wait a second. We did those. I think I covered everything. Um, last, last question. The last two questions. Um, 
of whether Atzil, Atzilim are the nobles, but most almost all the Parshim think that Atzilim are the people who came up. Um, would anyone today change the order of the Torah without a basis in Chazal? Probably not, unless you learn, unless you're a teacher in Herzog, I guess. You do that in, in Vayishlach. The story of uh, Dean, I think you change out of order. No, if I remember correctly. I mean, I'm just following. I don't mean you. I, I I don't mean it. And I'm and in part. I think you you suggested that as a sort of very interesting idea. Oh yeah, to put like the the in Dina Vayishlach, story comes after the yeah. story. Yeah. Um, if you want to so, read his, his studies on the Parsha, yeah. so Rabbi Leptak there yeah. suggests answer a series of problems. Yeah. That but may be anybody, yeah, but I'm a nobody. She but says you anyone. teach in Herzog. Yeah, yeah, okay. But a nobody can, not in anyone. Okay. No, no. <laughs> but, okay. So um, maybe in anybody. Listen, <laughs> you have to be Chazal somebody to be a nobody. Chazal, you know that old joke. Because <laughs> I'll entertain the possibility in Parshim of, of all the centuries move Parshiot around. The, yeah, Parshim is latest 100 years ago moving Parshiot around. That the Tziv does it. Bukhoshor does it. There, uh, there's, a, I think there's a Bukhoshor that even says, you know, stories of the, um, I think Mark, Rabbi La, and Dr. Lakshman talks about this a lot, about what Parshim do to move things around. To... Yeah, he hasn't addressed that so much, I don't think, in his classes, but okay, I'll ask him. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Uh, Actually, people there, do it. One, you're you're I, in I, good I company. I heard. Someone wanted to say that the story of um, Maim Riva happened, you know, that 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 uh, Masam Riva in Parshim B'Shalach was really, as, was a promo for what's happening later in in, in Parsha Chukat. But it's just, it's just the same story. But it's like it, it, everyone moves Parsha around because Chumash is not in chronological order because it's not a book to read, it's a book to study. Now, what you move, you definitely, everyone has a license to move the Parsha around. But it's from God. The question is, why did God do that? But, they, but it, other than Ramban, even Ramban agrees to move Parsha around when he has to. The question, you know, how quickly, how quick are you to do it? Okay, next week's show will be a lot easier. It'll be free for, we'll do Parshat Mishpatim. Next week's show, we're going to talk about how the Ten Commandments affect the law sections. And we're going to take that unit of chapters 20 to 23, the one we skipped today, and open up and see what's inside. That'll be a nice, organized, you know, careful study of the, of, of the verses. Uh, but today's show was just, let's, I guess, called that an Eun Shir. It's okay. It's good. It's good to have that every once in a while. I, I was just, in, I think it was in honor of Rashi. I think, I Rashi, people I make think. fun of Rashi saying Nashim was like, you know, like the way the Ramban attacks Rashi, like, what's he talking about? And I'm, I want to simply support Rashi. I say, I always say Rashi, Ramban's 100% right and Rashi's even better. Okay. Because when you read, if Ramban makes so much sense when you read it, but when you read it carefully, that my key point was those last five lines of chapter 19 are totally confusing unless chapter 24 happened beforehand. The first 11 verses of chapter 24. That's my main point. I tried to show you why. Didn't solve everything, but it it uh it it's def I'm it's definitely what Chazal say, and it's worth a share to appreciate Chazal that they're not just coming out of nowhere. They're it's it's not just based on Masar, it's based on Parsha Nut. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's I'm way the, over time. So that's we'll stop a, here. The Torah is is purposely ambiguous, as we like to say. Yeah, because it wants to give multiple. And, messages. I told you my point was I think God wanted Rashi and Ramban uh, to argue. Of course, that's the value in Rashi's opinion is the value in Ramban's opinion. A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. What really okay. happened? That's that's postmodernism. Yeah. Okay. Thank they both you. Both happened, even though they can't both happen, but they both happened. Elu ve elu. My my, my point because they're constant. Those stories are constantly happening. Remember, Bayom is about Midbar Sinai. That dialectic of Avan Yira, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a one event story. It's above time. It's stories that are happening all the time. But that's already that's Hasidut. That's okay. Thank you. Tomorrow, be, in English, Rabbi Shvat continuing a series on religious Zionism. We'll talk about Hebrew, not just in another language. The importance of Hebrew. We mentioned on Friday that the Mitzvah Kala, the Rambam says. Uh, be careful, Miss Vakala. That is the study of Hebrew. Anyway, so that's tomorrow. Mark Shapiro, um, tomorrow night, 8 30, continuing his fascinating series on his correspondence with the various rabbinic figures. And Tuesday, Chassidud and Megillat Rud. And Wednesday, Triple Header. On Thursday, all through the week, uh, regular Shirim. Uh, this week's Parsha Shir, Rabbi Shaw Robinson of Lincoln Square Synagogue will be giving the Parsha Shir. And Rabbi Leaptag, I want to let you know that you must be a somebody because on Thursday night's Parsha Shir, Rebecca Winter, she didn't go through. It, but in her last presentation, quoted your whole uh, triastic structure of Sefer Shmot. Um, you know, if you let me, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to show you what she did. I think I can do this. Just yeah, I taught her back in Lindebaum way back. Yeah, so she quoted you. 
you'll be happy to know. Um, and I'll show you what she did. Uh, I have it up. I hopefully, yeah, you see this? This is her last screen. This is from you, Rabbi Nachum Liebzak, Brit before my Torah. She didn't actually explain it. She said, you can all look at it, but she just, she put it up on the- uh, and that's from my, It's from like 30 years ago from my website. Yeah. Okay, there, yeah. there, there you go. So I just wanted to figure it out, bring that to your attention. So you, you must, maybe you I, used I to be a nobody, but the now you're Ganesha. somebody. I'm sorry? I think that's from the Cairo Geniza. Yeah, you know, it's only when, uh, you know, when, when other people start quoting you, that's when you know you're like a somebody. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, anyways, all right, then. We'll see you next week. Please, God, and all the best. should be a, a joyous week for everybody. Uh, should be good news, and uh, please, God, we'll see you during the week for learning. And like I always say, please do invite a friend. You know, I know we invite uh, lots of regulars at our classes, which is great. Uh, but if we want to, you know, expand the base a little bit, and you can invite somebody to try a class that you think they might like. If they don't like it, we'll give them their, their money back. So uh, it's okay. They won't get rich that way. But anyways, okay, everybody have a wonderful day, wonderful week, all the best. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Yes, guys.